Welcome to Bloomberg Law on Demand. I'm Lee Pacquia. The Obama administration has reversed course this week, capitulating to those wishing to see Khalid Sheikh Mohammed tried in front of a military tribunal rather than a federal courtroom. Joining me now to discuss, we have Marcellus McRae, a partner at the law firm Gibson Dunn. Marcellus, thanks so much for coming in today. Welcome Thank to you. the program. So earlier in the week, Attorney General Eric Holder announced that lawyers for the United States military are going to file war crime charges against uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and his four co-defendants in a military tribunal. Uh, they're reversing course. We're not going to see a trial in uh, United States federal court. What happened here? How do you think we got to this point? I think it's probably a convergence of a number of factors. Um, obviously, you have a concern by some uh, that the civil justice system may not have been able to procure a conviction. And I think this is a situation where this is what you would call a must-win trial. Obviously, there are precedents where Galani and others who have been accused of acts of terrorism have been tried, where convictions have been secured. But I think certainly there is that concern that this is a must-win situation. Yeah. Now, now, you're a well-known trial expert. Do you think possibly the government looked at the evidence that they had in their portfolio and had an uh-oh moment, for, for lack of a better term, and said, we might not have the evidence that we thought we did. Let's get this out of federal court. Let's put this in front of a military tribunal where the, the standards might perhaps be easier. I think that's certainly a possibility. And I think that if you also look and cite Galani as an interesting precedent, uh, where, as you'll recall, even though there was ultimately a conviction that was secured and a life sentence, there was an acquittal on more than 200 charges. And so I think that if you couple that with this must-win sort of heightened state need to secure a conviction, that may have rolled in possibility. All right. So let's jump back for a second here and get a little bit of a better understanding Understanding of the landscape. In the United States, uh, we have Article I courts, we have Article III courts, among others. Um, let's get the differences out there. A military tribunal would, this military tribunal would fi file under Article I. Right. Federal court would be under Article III. What are the distinctions? There's some very critical distinctions. I mean, one of the distinctions is that unlike the system that most of us are used to, only two thirds of the jury here needs to have an agreement to secure a conviction. I think the other issue is that we have this fundamental notion of a right to confront and cross-examine our accusers. Obviously, in these tribunals, there isn't going to be a right to have all of the evidence presented to you. Therefore, it can be considered in secret. The other thing is that you typically have an understanding of a right to have counsel of your choosing. That isn't a right here as well. Also, consider the fact that even if there is a conviction, uh, you know, and, and you, you have a situation where there are some other factors that go into this, uh, including the ability to use testimony that may have been the subject of coercion. Now, to a lot of people, that offends both the Fifth Amendment and perhaps even the Eighth Amendment. And consider this possibility as well. Even if there's an acquittal, it isn't inexorable that that would necessarily lead to a release. There are other distinctions, but when you just consider those as examples, those are some pretty significant departures from mm -hmm. what we consider to be sort of fundamental rights. Uh, and obviously the justification for that is the notion that these are not ordinary uh, alleged criminals that are being tried, but these people have obviously committed uh, acts that uh, warrant a departure from those protections. So procedurally, taking a look at this, we were talking before about how the government basically threw out the script and came up with procedures for how this is going to go, almost on the back of a napkin. How do you expect this to play out? What's going to be the, the procedural uh, aspect that people need to take note of? I think one of the procedural aspects, perhaps during the trial itself, I've already sort of outlined some of the differences, is you know the ability of this uh, body, which is going to consist of military personnel, uh, to be able to consider and deliberate in private. In other words, outside the present of the defendants. I think the other issue, quite frankly, and I think this is a concern, is the possibility that these convictions will be subject to challenge. In fact, you know, you have this sense that once they are procured, what is going to be the development as far as appellate procedure? You have this military commission review, but beyond that, is there another strata or avenue of appeal? But certainly I think that there are going to be uh, concerns about the extent to which these people, in fact, did have a fair trial, uh, whether or not it's going to be subject to collateral attacks, and whether or not the convictions, once secured, are ultimately going to be, as far as implementation, delayed because of those potential procedural challenges. A lot of people are asking what this means for our rule of law. What happens to the system? Um, have we inadvertently created a multi-tiered system of justice? Well, I think we're there. Uh, I mean, clearly, with respect to this particular subgroup, 
we are already there. The decision has already been made. They will not be tried in federal courts. They'll be tried not in an Article III court, but in these tribunals. Uh, the question is whether or not we can effectively compartmentalize this and narrow it just to this discrete insular group. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's really the open question. Um, you know, if you see a proliferation of these examples in other contexts, then obviously people will be talking about a slippery slope and heightened concern. But make no mistake about it, the legislation was passed on the heels of 9-11. We have these tribunals. They are going to be used. We already are there. We're going to see this happen again. Well, certainly with respect to anyone else that falls under uh, this system. In other words, people that are deemed to be unlawful combatants, people that are in Guantanamo that are subject to that sort of uh, prosecution, those people will be subject to those proceedings. The question as to whether or not it will be emulated with respect to other forms, I think, is open. But at least this will be a precedent. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you've seen a lot in your career, and, and I, I guess I'm going to ask you a question that's a little bit outside your, your area of sure. expertise, but uh, what does your gut tell you when you take a look at this? Is this Was this largely a political decision that was made by the administration? Administration, or was there? Do you think there's a legitimate legal reason for keeping this proceeding out of United States federal court? I got to tell you, I, I think that my gut feeling is that the political considerations probably predominated. Um, you know, quite frankly, uh, the the Article Three courts could have very easily and effectively uh, been able to do what they're supposed to do, which is to have a trial under rule of law. There is, as I said, precedent not only with respect to uh, Galani, but you also have Massawi, you also have Reed. In other words, there is uh, you know, a series of things that we can look at where other people uh, who were engaged allegedly in terrorist acts have been uh, you know, the subject of convictions and are now serving sentences. So it's not a question of uh, infrastructure or process or capability of being able to secure the convictions is really a question of will in terms of utilizing it. And when you have the clamoring about expense, the concern about heightened security, and also, as I said, you know, the predominant consideration of will we inexorably secure these convictions, I think the political weight of those things gained traction and ultimately may have eclipsed some of these concerns about legal purity. All right. Well, tough stuff. Marcellus, we'll have to leave it there for now, but I want to thank you so much for coming in today. Thank you. All right. That's Marcellus McRae. He is a partner at the law firm Gibson Dunn. If you'd like to learn more about the issues we just discussed, go check out our offerings on BloombergLaw.com and also on the Bloomberg Terminal. I'm Lee Pacquia. Thanks for watching.